BBC Four Collections, specially chosen programmes from the BBC Archive. I'm uh, Corporal Wade, Section Commander from uh, Grantham in Lincolnshire. I get my orders from the platoon commander and they follow mine out in the field. Um, and also all these uh, hills and big peaks you see, we've got certain pickets up there. And every other day we usually get a all day and all night picket. And we sit up on top of these hills and just watch the valleys down below for any dissident tribesmen that are wandering about. These uh, Arabs are laying landmines along the road and our vehicles are going over the top and getting blown up. Well, our job is to go out, sit in a position and watch certain sectors of the road and stop the Arabs uh, laying the mines. So we just sit here all night and just watch the road. The road they watch is the road to Mecca, the sacred road which begins at Aden and runs northwest for a thousand miles. And in the mountains, there's war. To passengers on the deck of a visiting liner, the war in the Radfan Mountains could be a thousand miles away, instead of just 60. The Arabs still greet every ship with their boatloads of goods at irresistible prices. They've done it for 50 years, but the stuff isn't made in Birmingham any longer. Now it's all Japanese. Cameras, recorders, watches and toys. It's all here, the worthwhile and the trash, and it's all very cheap. Aden has been a marketplace for the Arab world for 2,000 years. Built in the crater of a dead volcano, it became a British possession when it was captured in the name of Queen Victoria in 1839 by a Captain Haynes. For 125 years, Britain has used Aden as a base, and with her vast oil interests throughout the Middle East, Aden has a vital role in the British government's policy. The growing Arab pressure against the British, fomented by the Egyptians, makes the tenancy an uneasy one. There is evidence of Western culture, and from floor to ceiling, the shops bulge. Ironically, the affluence of the shopkeepers would be absent were it not for the British. For the Arabs have not been slow to cash in on the large numbers of servicemen and tourists who've stayed here during the past 25 years. Camel and Cadillac blend well in Aden. They need about the same parking space, and housing can be cheap. A visit to the docks for some packing cases, and then do it yourself. In a climate where it almost never rains, and every day it's over 100 degrees, something to keep the burning sun out. That's all that's really needed. It's British commerce, not the Royal Navy, which is predominant in the free port of Aden. The Admiral lives here, but his navy is a thousand miles away in the Persian Gulf. 6,000 ships a year anchor in the Aden roads, a maritime crossroads of the world's trade routes. The ships refuel from floating oil stores for the long journeys east or west, whilst the Arabian dhows sleep peacefully in a floating junkyard of their own. Cormaxar, Aden's international airport, is halfway along the route from Britain to the Far East. It's the RAF's biggest and busiest airbase. Squadrons of Victor bombers, Hunter fighters and Shackleton long-range search aircraft, ready to fly to any trouble spot. The Royal Air Force has had an airbase here for 40 years, but in its whole history, the runway has never been busier than this year, with an aircraft landing or taking off every two minutes. Six civil airlines and transport command every year move half as many passengers as London Airport. It's the hunter squadrons of Middle East Air Force that provide the first hint of the war. From first light at five o'clock until visibility fails at six in the evening, two jet fighters thunder into the sky. Sometimes they're carrying cameras, mostly they're carrying death and destruction in the shape of rockets and cannons. Their target is a place in the Radfan Mountains. They'll search the mountainous area, ferreting among the valleys at treetop level for an hour or so until their fuel runs low. If they see anything suspicious, they'll shoot. 
but flying up and down the what is it usually enough to discourage anyone from doing anything suspicious they too are watching the sacred road for centuries the camel caravans have trailed along the road from aden to the holy city of mecca today they make the journey under the watchful eyes and guns of british soldiers the placid progress of the camels has been shattered by the military convoys, two or three a week in each direction. Twenty or thirty three-ton trucks and a few field cars strung out make a smoke screen of dust more than a mile long. Their progress through the Arab villages near Aden scarcely raises an eyebrow anymore. They've seen it all before, and there's no money to be made out of British soldiers who just drive through. The convoy leaves at dawn and drives relentlessly up country. So far, the road has been smooth and the people friendly. Most of the half million inhabitants of South Arabia live by the land. Because of the poor rainfall, cultivation is largely confined to fertile valleys and plains irrigated by age-old traditional methods. The rainfall, when it comes in the monsoon season, comes with frightening swiftness. A storm in the mountains can fill a wadi, a dried up riverbed, in a few hours. Where there was a desert track, there can be 15 feet of water. It rushes down from the hills like a tidal wave, carrying everything with it. One such wave carried two three-ton trucks several miles and left them wrecked, just as suddenly as it had picked them up. For the army drivers, the swift running water is just another hazard in a journey that gets more difficult every mile. Camel caravan may be slow, but you don't have to winch them out. The tension begins to mount at the foothills of the Radfan Mountains. The country has changed, it's greyer. The sand has given way to rocks underneath the lorry wheels. Everyone is quieter, more watchful. If the convoy stops, sentries get up high to protect it. Vigilant eyes too from the scout cars in touch with each other and with Aden by radio. The enemy may be hidden behind the rocks. Death may come from the road ahead. Milestone 13 painted on the rock face. It was here that a mine blew up. An officer was killed. No one forgets it. A Beverly lands at Thumir, deep in the mountains where the Radfan tribe lived until last May when they were driven off by the British. The road to Mecca is now a landing strip. Blood feuds are common in these Arabian mountains where often only the rifle speaks between tribes. The Radfan tribesmen have waged war for centuries against travelers who dared to enter this remote backwater. But when they discarded their ancient rifles and began to use modern weapons supplied by Egypt, the situation was too much for the federal government and the British stepped in. The Air Force has flown in huge quantities of supplies to support the army in the field, for the first scent of victory would have brought in all the other tribes in a grand slam war against the federal government. Aden itself could have been under fire. British commandos paratroops and men of the Royal Anglian Regiment went in in force. This is the base camp of the Forgotten War. The way in by air is the easy way. For men going to the more remote parts by sandbagged field car, there's always danger beneath their wheels. Going along the road in a truck, you don't know if there's going to be a mine in front of you. That's what I don't like about it the most. Because you don't... 20 trucks can go over one of these mines and... 21st could be you. That's the only part I don't like. Sitting on the back of a truck. 
I don't mind walking because your old feet can heal up, but if you go up in a mine, you can't heal up. That's what I don't like. In one day, two trucks were blown up by mines and eight men were injured. That's the shape the war has taken now, with guerrilla fighting and mining incidents the routine of the day. Weapons are never far from hand, and unceasing vigilance must somehow be coupled with routine tasks. And there's no respite from the burning sun, the tormenting flies, and the all-enveloping dust. Equipment has a short life out here. When the war started, everything went in by air. Trucks, field guns, men and ammunition. Today, where possible, they go by road. But there are still mountain tops where only aircraft can supply the troops. Jebel Wadina, a rocky plateau, 5,600 feet up. There's no road, and helicopters can only take small loads. So most of the supplies for the men go in by parachute. There's one vital commodity that they must get at all costs, and that's water. Twice a week, eight one-ton containers are dropped. For the men below, it's a ration of about two gallons a day. No expenses spared to give these troops what they need. The cost of the Radfan operation must already run into millions of pounds. British officials have had time to reflect that a fraction of the money spent on improving the tribesmen's conditions during the long British rule might have prevented the war. A well here, some farming know-how there, might have made the tribesmen much less vulnerable to Cairo propaganda. but the parachutes still float down to the isolated soldiers who wait and wonder how long the war against the unseen Arabs can go on. Son! I'm being fired at by a sniper immediately in my front! A sniper's bullet brings the hilltop troops into action. My action! Oh, rapid fire! These mountains are honeycombed with caves that the rebels use for cover. They've been built up by squabbling tribesmen over the centuries, but each one has to be investigated, and each one could mean trouble.
A smoke bomb failed to bring anyone out, but three rifles were left by an enemy in a hurry. The guns found in these caves range from spindly muzzle loaders to the latest Czechoslovakian rifles. The importance of dominating the hilltops is that the Arabs feel a psychological disadvantage in being below their enemy, but these peaks had to be won the hard way. After a forced march of 14 miles, Marine commandos climbed 3,500 feet in pitch darkness to take Cap Badge Ridge. Just before dawn, they took the summit, but from their vantage point, the Marines were powerless to help a company of paratroopers who were advancing through the valley below. They were caught in the open in daylight and pinned down all day under withering fire from the village ahead. These operations were not carried out without cost, and up on Cap Badge, two Marines will have their own memorial on the rocks they fought for, at least until the paint fades. The Marines have gone, and today the Anglians keep watch on Cap Badge. In my opinion, it's hot, hard work, in my opinion. You're climbing all over these mountains and all that. They started doing these patrols, no sleep, really like. Yeah. Pretty hard work, really. During the day, you try and kip, but I'm afraid you can't. It's too hot and there's too many flies around. So you can't sleep very well. We've been cut off and, you know, getting the same sort of rations every day. Getting sort of like fed up with it. I mean, say Chicken Supreme is all right once and every now and again, but when you get a week on the run, that's a little bit jarring. The heat don't bother me either. If I go up to, like it did do the other day, 124, 128, I don't mind. Because that don't affect me. Some people blister, well, I don't blister, so I'm dark skinned, so I'm all right. The heat ain't bothering me so far. The greatest luxury in life on the mountains is warm beer. It's kept in buckets of water or holes in the ground or under rocks, but it doesn't make any difference. It still tastes as if it's been in the oven. Another of the simple pleasures is having water poured over your head. Cuts and mosquito bites covered in dust and dirt become open sores all too easily. Cleanliness is vital in this heat. The only contact that Corporal Briggs and his small platoon have with the outside world is the radio and the passing aircraft. Sometimes a spotter plane makes a detour to drop in the mail and the newspapers from home. The mail here is a hit or miss affair, but when it does arrive, it's more than welcome. Myself, I don't get much mail from them. This is the first letter I've heard from my sister-in-law since about three months ago. But apart from that, I do get letters from the girl I'm writing to. My mother is too old to write. She's getting on for 70 and she's nearly blind, so she can't write a lot. I excuse her for that. This is the first time I've been up here that I've actually seen papers. The last two or three times I've been up here when we've been up here, I've never seen papers. This is the first time we've been issued with them. The soldiers spend three or four weeks in the Radfan, then back down to Aden for a month's rest. It works well. You need something to look forward to in this desolation. For the crews of the Belvedere helicopters, it's a bit like a grocery round. At the start of the operation, they seldom made a trip without being shot at from the ground. Now the enemy has gone under cover, and they rarely see a movement in the deserted valleys. Each morning, the pilot gets a list of his calls, and it's up to him how he visits them. Food, water, ammunition, beer. That's what he's delivering on the most exciting grocer's round in the world. For even if there's no shooting, it's still tricky flying. The sun, reflecting up off the rocks, plays tricks with thermal drafts. Landing, sometimes on ledges scarcely bigger than the helicopter itself, can be a dangerous business. But so far, 
there's only been one fatal crash. It only takes minutes to unload and the visitor is away again. A giant mayfly against the distant mountains, leaving the platoon alone again. In the Wadi Tame, it's the planting season, their spring. But no crops are being sown this year, for the tribesmen have been kept off their land. They've lost a whole year's crops and cannot return until they sue for peace. Their stock has wandered away and their villages have been smashed. This is the price they pay for murder and subversion, yet still they hold out. The scene is deceptively peaceful, for it's here in the Wadi Tame that things can explode with sudden violence. A sentry spots a movement, and A Company of the Anglian Regiment rushes into action. Ferret's scout cars of the 16th 5th Lancers are on their way to investigate. An armoured car hidden behind a war-shattered house moves out to bring its 76mm gun into play. The men here rarely see the enemy they're fighting. The rebels move in twos and threes at night to lay their mines, and if they shoot, they rarely move in closer than a thousand yards. A couple of nights ago, this camp was fired on, very inaccurately, by a Belgian-made rocket launcher. Tonight, they may be more accurate if the sentries don't spot them first. You can never tell if you've hit them. By the time British patrols arrive, the Arabs have gone and taken their dead with them. For men longing for action, it's often frustrating never to get to grips with the enemy. All they can do is to blaze away with all they've got and hope for the best. From nearby tabletop airstrip, howitzers can drop high explosives on almost any spot in the wadi. The cost in casualties has been comparatively light. Ten men have died. 47 have been injured. But to the soldier in the sun, fighting this forgotten war, it's mostly a life of hardship. I'd say it was a bit rough, a bit dodgy at times, for these mines and such like. Because I myself haven't seen a, one of these rebels yet. I heard some of my mates have seen them. Some of my mates have got injured. But we don't see them, we, they just take shots at us. When we can't see them, when they can see us. That's when it's a bit dodgy. That's rough up here. I think I'd rather be back at Norwich in the five ways for the nice pint any day. <laughs> 